that's the theme of the randomization and tell us about the role of the randomization in TCS. Everyone, where are you? And uh, my plan is the following. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about myself, what I like to think about, questions that I like. Uh, then I'm going to share a couple of interesting tidbits from recent years, results and directions that are interesting to think of that I want to focus while I'm here. And in the end, I'll leave some time for questions. But as you can see, I have a precise timeline for each of these parts. Okay, so uh, the randomization just we're still in the same context this is usually the type of thing I like to start, uh, start from, start thinking about and branch out from. So these are the type of questions in the area, right? We use randomness all the time in theoretical computer science, but in many settings, it's not really clear why we do it, because I mean, we don't understand whether or not it really helps make computation more efficient in a lot of settings. So the methodology is the randomization, right? Let's grab the random coins and simulate them. And the cost of doing so is the value of randomness in this particular setting. This is what TJ talked about. And in the recent works, we've been able to show that under uh, plausible assumptions, the value might be actually zero in many settings. Okay. The second question is, uh, how can we do so? I mean, how, could you, how can you de-randomize stuff? And the classical answer is pseudo random generators. And Lydia talked about new non-black box approaches. Which other methods are there and what can they teach us about the problem that we don't know and don't understand yet? And to prove that the methods work, we need to make assumptions. The classical ones were for pseudo random generators were circuit lower bounds. New methods have weaker assumptions. Which assumptions are necessary and sufficient for the randomization? And the third question is, what are the broader implications of doing the randomization on computer science? And this is how I look at the world when I wake up in the morning, okay? No, I'm not saying that this is exactly how the world looks like, but it's my perspective. The randomization is really at the heart of computer science, right? It's inherently related to any other area, P versus NP, robots for circuits, robots for Turing machines, crypto, interactive proofs, meta complexity, learning theory, fine grain, anything. And the thing is that I don't have a good explanation why. I mean, the randomization is interesting because it's an important question. We use randomness all the time. And it's a challenging question. We've been dealing with it for a long time. So obviously it's important. And another reason that it's important is that it's so interconnected. But I don't have a one minute elevator pitch to explain why it's so interconnected other than listing 20 technical theorems that explain this. So the usual mode of research in the area is to start from a question about randomness. I take a class of algorithms and try to grab the random coins and take them away and branch out to work in circuit complexity, interactive proofs, crypto, structures, et cetera, across the theoretical computer science. So a couple of other questions that I like thinking about. So in circuit complexity, for example, unconditional randomization and lower bounds for threshold circuits is something I've been doing in recent years. And for essentially any other frontier in circuit complexity that we all know and work on. And more generally, like uh, moving onwards with new approaches for circuit complexity. We know that math and combinatorics aren't enough. This is Rasbo of Udich. Um, okay, Ryan gave us new tools, the algorithmic method, so we can throw the randomization, algorithm design, and interactive proofs. Cool, which other tools from theory can we throw at the problem of circuit complexity? This is now a problem in theoretical computer science. We have lots of tools in theory. What can we throw at it? And in particular, how can we relax the, for example, the algorithms in Ryan's approach to get to still get circuit lower bounds? I'm going to talk about it in a second. And more generally, let's call it sharing, sharing techniques between different areas in theoretical computer science. For example, can we do a complexity analysis of crypto primitives? Can we construct randomization algorithms from proof systems? And so on. Okay. I wanna share a few interesting tidbits that I think you might be curious about and that are more an invitation to think about rather than the specific results themselves. I think these are areas that are worth exploring and that I'd like to explore while I'm here. These are three specific things. The first one Ligia just mentioned, it follows from a work of us from a couple of years ago. So PRGs are equivalent to circuit lower bounds. And as Ligia said, okay, it's totally natural to ask, great, what is the randomization equivalent to? Maybe it's equivalent to, to something that might be weaker. 
And let you present one condition for Morocco fast, this almost all inputs hardness, right? There's a function in P such that every probabilistic, let just said n to the 10, I wrote n to the 20. That's because I'm a more hesitant person and Lijia is more confident, so I wrote n to the 20. Okay, it fails to compute it on all but finitely many inputs. And we show the bidirectional connection. We conjecture it can be turned into an equivalence. Okay, this gives one target answer. It's actually a great open problem in case you want to talk about it. But uh, something more interesting happened later. It turns out that randomization is actually fully formally equivalent to a sequence of notions from different areas in theoretical computer science. For example, in two works of uh, Yanni Lu and Raphael Pass, shows that show that they're equivalent to the almost all input variant of hardness of conditional Kolmogor time bounded Kolmogorov complexity and of leakage resilient hardness from crypto and an upcoming work with Legion with a third co-author who I haven't asked before the talk so I can't say who he is but we're working on it there's another notion which subsumes this and the point isn't that the randomization is equivalent to notions from different areas in TCS is that like trivially now that we have this all of these notions are equivalent to each other, right? The, the hardness of conditional time bound Kolmogorov complexity is equivalent to leakage resilience hardness, is equivalent to a notion from complexity, and we don't know how to prove it without centering the randomization in this picture. And more importantly, I don't think, so it's a new emerging network, and I don't think we understand it well enough. How crucial is the almost all inputs condition? How deep are the connections between these different notions? Oh, so there's, a, there's, so there's a function like x to fx yeah. that's hard to compute even with some leakage from fx, but it's hard for every x. Resilient hardness. Yeah. It's hard even to say, even after you give each. Yeah, square root of the yeah. output, it gives you the hard to compute and for every single output. Mm -hmm. There are weird phenomena in this new network of connections. For example, weak leakage resilient hardness, like hardness with uh, small leakage gives you hardness with large these connections. So yeah, that's an invitation to take because we don't understand this well enough yet. It's, it's also very new, it's less than a year old. Okay, another thing, I'd like to present a notion that's uh, very new. It's from a work with Lige that's under submission, but that's so basic that if you have been taught in uh, complexity 101, 101 this notion, and they would have told you that this is a notion from the 80s, you would have said, sure, like, of course. So this is computationally sound NP. And we all know NP, we love NP. Correct statements can be proved, incorrect statements cannot be proved, wonderful. And we know and love argument systems from crypto. Interactive proof, where like uh, you can be convinced, but no efficient adversary can convince you. You have only computational soundness. So this is the computationally sound version of NP. Correct statements can be proved, Incorrect statements, no adversary can find the written proof and send it to you. There's no interaction. So it's an NP type argument system, a very natural notion. So here's the definition. We say that the language has a doubly efficient, uh, uh, sorry, deterministic effective argument system. If there's an NP type verifier that's advanced in the allotted time and satisfies the following condition, right? You can prove correct statements to it. So there's an efficient prover that like, given a correct statement, it prints a proof, sends it to the verifier, the verifier says yes. But on the other hand, the soundness condition is computational. No efficient adversary can fool the verifier except with negligible probability, where fooling the verifier here means finding an incorrect statement and the proof that will make the verifier say yes. Oh, so does, does the efficient prover need to see an original version? Ah, okay, so the, I, this right now, the definition as it is, it's like uh, only for BPP problems, right? Because there are no witnesses here. But you can equip the honest prover with a witness and you can equip if you want the dishonest prover with a witness to extend it to NP. This is standard stuff from crypto. So I just wanted to focus on like one self-contained definition. You can extend it if you want. No, that for all P with running time poly polynomial. Yes, but I'm saying the Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, the, definition only, the definition only makes sense if the honest prover is efficient too, otherwise you can trivially get this stuff for. I'm saying that. Precisely, exactly. And there's another subtlety here, but it's very natural. Like usually in arguments, the soundness is for what is worst case input. 
that for every input that you can produce a proof, mm -hmm. we said that okay, the adversary cannot find an input and a proof. So it's sort of average case. But I mean it's very natural scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a new natural notion like computationally sound entity. What can you what can you do with it? So in the work we showed passing through the randomization of proof systems and yada yada, but forget about it. This is self-contained st statement. Under strong assumptions, you can solve sharp up too quickly in computationally sound entity. Okay, remember, we, we believe that traps that cannot be solved by a non-deterministic machine like in MP, real MP, right? In time uh, two to the epsilon n, where epsilon is as small as you want. But under a strong assumption in this computation, sound MP, you can beat that. You can solve traps that in time two to the epsilon n, where epsilon is as small as constant as you want. And I mean, there, there's no reason to assume that this is the optimal running time. If we take inspiration from classical results in crypto, like Killian, maybe we can do polynomial time too. Like this is a new relaxed notion of NP that allows bypassing certain um, barriers and obstacles. Right, but, but again, like even for the excess, even if, if I would have made a worst case statement, right, for every X this thing holds, it still would have been the case that for every X there might have been a proof that's convinced it's a very fair and you just can find it. In both cases, it's computation. But we're saying that something that's interesting about arguments is that they might be proving you incorrect things, so that's okay. It's never that they're Yeah, exactly. Exactly, 100%. But what I was saying is that the, the, the reason for the computational relaxation holds for the worst case and for the average case settings so in the same way. Like one, one thing says for every input you can find a proof here, you can find an input and a proof. So in the feasible world, no one can see it. Okay, so computationally sound MP, right? Totally new. We haven't thought about it for long, so it's really open. Can you solve sharp set more quickly? Which other hard problems can you solve with it? What could you do in this new model that people haven't thought of? It's probably an open-ended question that's really worth pursuing. Okay. The last thing I wanna talk about has to do with uh, weak forms of derandomization implies lower bounds or strong forms because weak derandomization still implies lower bounds. So let's, uh, I'm gonna talk about quantified derandomization. Let's zoom back to Ryan Williams' result. Ryan told us that to prove lower bounds, it suffices to, fall, to solve the following derandomization problem. I give you a circuit over n bits, and you need to decide between the case that the circuit accepts all of its inputs and the case that the circuit accepts at most half of its inputs, right? You need to do it in non-trivial time, so better than two to the n, two to the n over a large enough polynomial. And I wanna introduce notation. So the, there's a number of exceptional inputs here, right? In the second case, the circuit accepts at most half of its inputs. So at most two to the n over two. Let's denote it by b, just a parameter. And of course, if I wanna distinguish between a case that the circuit accepts all of its inputs and the circuit accepts at most B inputs, I can do it in time B plus one times the circuit size, right? To just go over more than B inputs and distinguish between the two cases, no problem. And Ryan's result from this perspective tells us that for this value of B, doing so in time better than B, B over polylog is enough to get circuit lower bounds. Uh, this type of uh, problem, when you have this parameter value B, it's a type of quantified problem, it's a quantified randomization problem. And the point that I want to make in reframing this is that it turns out that you can generalize Ryan's result. So there's nothing special about this B. If you can solve this quantified randomization problem in time better than B, for any value of B, you get circuit lower bounds. So for any nice value, like time computable or whatever, if you can distinguish between the case that the circuit accepts all of its inputs and the circuit accepts its most B of its inputs in time better than B, then you get lower bounds. And it's the same lower bounds and the same relaxations as in Ryan's result, it's a black box reduction to Ryan's result. Where the point that I want to make here is that, okay, what's going on? Like, uh, it's not that the randomization was holy, like uh, one versus half in the acceptance probability, any value would do. So what makes this problem so special? Yeah, you do. Sorry? No? Well, if you, no, actually not. It works for polynomial, you just have to be careful. Okay. But other than have you originally phrased the problem in terms of B as a polynomial, it applies, it applies to that too. Then, but instead of like B over polynomial B, then you'd have like a B to the one minus epsilon. Polynomial. But I, I look at this and it starts, it, it gets me asking questions like, okay, what's special about this? What kind of weak algorithms are enough to get circuit lower bounds? Like uh, the randomization is sort of a classical thing, but if this weaker thing is enough, what are we missing? Where can we go next? This is another thing that I have to think about. Uh, and that was it.
This is the time for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions? And let me have the next speaker set up. That was a nice name for B of N. Uh, time computable increasing. Oh, really? Just yeah, like, okay, normal stuff. So, there are analog of quantified derandomization in the uniform setting, like a similar kind of relaxation with a smooth threshold that you can move around. Like for uniform circuits? Um, no, no, like the, the characterization of next not equals BPP by like the um, very, very weak derandomization of BPP into sub exponential zero. Is, it, is there oh, a, that's a I haven't thought about That's a great question. Okay. Sorry, uh, for which circuit class? Oh, no, okay. So this is for general circuits. And once you go down to uh, weaker circuit classes, the picture changes. It's not like uh, any better than brute force would do. It's like, oh, we can do this unconditionally and any better than this would do. But the picture is identical across settings. Like every time the threshold, the gap between the known result and the threshold result is consistently tiny. And there are some explanations. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you.